This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello, the ancient Greek mathematician Pythagoras is probably better known than most of his illustrious successors over the last two and a half thousand years. This is thanks in part to the theorem concerning right-angled triangles that bears his name. Yet he left no texts behind. We know next to nothing about his life. Some scholars have doubted that he ever existed. We do know that a sect called the Pythagoreans emerged in Italy in the 5th century BC, but they're as well known for their bizarre beliefs as for their mathematical innovations. Nonetheless, the ideas associated with Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans have had a deep impact on Western science and philosophy, inspiring Plato and Euclid, Copernicus and Newton. At the core of this is their belief that the truths that underlie reality can be found through numbers. With me to discuss Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans are Serafina Cuomo, reader in Roman history at Birkbeck College, University of London, John O'Connor, senior lecturer in mathematics at the University of St Andrews, and Ian Stewart, Emeritus Professor of Mathematics at the University of Warwick. Ian Stewart, how advanced was mathematics in the 6th century BC? Not a lot. It depends on which area you look at. Uh, The the whole of the Middle East had quite a strong mathematical tradition. The the Babylonians a thousand years ago knew quite a lot. But um, I mean a thousand years before. A thousand years before. Yeah, yeah, a thousand years before um, Pythagoras. So Mm. 1500 BC. Babylonians really knew a lot of mathematics in various ways. They could solve cubic equations, for example. What um, else? Quadratic equations particularly. They knew about the square root of two. Their method for cubics was rather rudimentary, but they nonetheless had one. Um, so they knew, I think, more than the Pythagoreans knew, because at the time of Pythagoras, that particular cult um, seemed to have gone back to rather lower level mathematics in many ways but the Pythagoreans knew about um, triangular numbers 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 that kind of thing they knew about the square root of 2 being an irrational number not being a fraction and they knew Pythagoras' theorem about the uh, sides of a right angled triangle can we just give us some give us some idea of the swirl of ideas around that time? It's an awful long time ago, and, <laughs> and we're going over an awful long time period. But it is fascinating because the idea of, of sects and, uh, and segments of society doesn't seem to apply. I mean, people are getting ideas from here, there, and everywhere. It, it's drifting out. Can you give us some idea? The Babylonians. We could go back to the Egyptians. We could bring in Greater Greece and just just fill it out a bit. The Babylonians were very strong on astronomy and I think quite a bit of their mathematics was for astronomical purposes. Um, They had very good observations of the movements of the planets. There are surviving clay tablets with uh, cuneiform inscriptions which can be recognised as tables of the movements of Jupiter and so on. Um, They also used mathematics for more practical purposes, taxation, land measurement, that kind of thing. Um, The Egyptians in some ways were not as advanced as the Babylonians. I think the Egyptians were focused a little more on the practical side of things. For example, they knew an awful lot about the mathematics of pyramids, as you might expect. Um, And uh, and the whole culture is a huge mixture and people are perpetually invading other people. But the ideas are floating around. And Pythagoras, it is said, went to Egypt and picked up some Egyptian ideas, although a lot of scholars say we haven't got a clue whether he really did. What about, just before I move on, what are the most important ideas associated with Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans? Just a brief resume before we... From a modern point of view, the most important one is the idea that number is the basis of nature, that the physical world works on numerical, mathematical principles. And some of their evidence for that came from musical sounds, and some of it was pure numerology, Um, They understood some very basic facts in geometry, such as Pythagoras' theorem. Um, They understood that um, irrational numbers existed. Uh, On the other hand, they embedded this in a kind of mysticism and numerology, and the Pythagoreans were a religious cult more than anything. So it's all mixed up, but there's a lot of interesting stuff sort of in there among the mysticism. 
It's interesting that the start of this is, is as much mystical and religious as, as, as mathematical, but Seraphine Aquema, let's get to the man himself. What's the traditional story of Pythagoras until, say, the end of the 19th century? Who was he thought to be? The traditional stories see him as a kind of holy man, as well as, as a philosopher, as a traveller who travelled to Egypt, perhaps Mesopotamia, but also to the underworld and back. So the traditional stories paint him as uh, almost a supernatural figure. Uh, according to some of the uh, anecdotes about him, he had uh, a golden thigh that he displayed to the public in Olympia. He could speak to animals, including eagles and bears. He could predict earthquakes. He could uh, uh, remember his previous lives. Uh, so um, the traditional picture does report to us something about uh, what we would call scientific achievements, but the side of him that was about spirituality, religion, miracles even, is much stronger. But that's common with people who found all sorts of cults, isn't it? In, in, uh, around that period, they're accredited with great miracles, being in two places at once, going to the underworld and coming back. Um, that trans Over the centuries, we then come to Christianity. So, yes. so that isn't unusual. Um, but the, w there is an inside story that he was born in Samos, in one of the Greek islands, which was it was a pre-Socratic society. It was half Persian, half Greek, which made it intellectually vibrant and so on. There, a story was tracked out as this is what this man did as a man. Yes, um, we seem to know for sure that he came from Samos, which is off the coast of Asia Minor. So at what we could call the interface between East and West, the boundary, if you like, between the Greek world and the Persian world. For reasons that are not well known, but could have to do with uh, his involvement in the political life of Samos, he emigrated and ended up in uh, Croton in southern Italy, where he seems to have made contact with the local authorities who encouraged him to teach young people of Croton, and the result is the foundation, if you like, of the first so-called Pythagorean sect. Now, current scholarship, or some current scholarship, would say that none of this obtains, that thoroughly investigated, nothing stands up, that he perhaps didn't exist at all. What's your assessment of the current scholar scholar scholastic view of the existence or not of Pythagoras? Yes, for a very long time, uh, scholars were more intent in trying to sift truth from reality. The major contribution to this operation came in 1962, um, by a scholar called uh, Walter Burkert. The book was translated into English in 1972. Anyway, Burkert, uh, through a very careful and thorough analysis of the sources, demonstrated, for many people demonstrated in uh, an uncontrovertible way, that Pythagoras was what he called a shaman, a religious figure, and that he made little, hardly any contribution to what we would call science. After Burkett, for many times, uh, most uh, scholars would just agree with this view. In more recent years, the end of the 90s and now in the 2000s, the notice and so on, um, more work has been published that is trying to rehabilitate some of the scientific side of the Pythagoreans. And actually said that there might have been a man called Pythagoras. That is a bit of an open question still. Open. It is actually known as the Pythagorean question. Yeah. Yes, I, I, it's another, it's another programme. It's the power of oral history, which we miss out on this programme a lot, and in this, because we have a cult of written records, and oral history lasted over several centuries in certain civilizations. And uh, Anyway, that's another question. John O'Connor, um, we know a, a lot more about the Pythagorean Pythagoreans. Um, so did they think they were following somebody who actually existed, or did they make the word up? Um, I think they did think that they were following somebody that existed. That, um, I always like to think of Pythagoras as actually a, um, a concrete character um, who was uh, the leader of a religious cult. But the, some of the people who came later um, and actually followed on Pythagoras, a, a chap called Philolaus, who... Um, was the first person to actually publish anything about the Pythagoreans' doctrine. But the Pythagoreans were a secret cult. They, um, they, they didn't publish what they um, knew, what they discovered. Um, and 
that's one of the reasons that the, um, the, the written record is so, is so difficult to follow, that it wasn't until quite a lot later that people actually started um, saying what things the Pythagoreans had done, and in particular in the case of Phil Allows, he published a book called um, On Nature, of which only fragments remain. And uh, Burke had actually reinstated some of the things that, uh, that Phil Allows would allege to have done. For many years it was thought that most of the Phil Allows' work was... Um, was um, plagiarized, was made up by later people, because um, Pythagoras had such a, a following in the centuries after um, he died that the um, the Pythagorean legend actually expanded greatly, and so the most of the um, sources that we have for Pythagoras uh, were written hundreds and hundreds of years after he uh, he actually um, did anything that people claimed. You've, the word religious has been used several times, and you've used the word cult as a sect, as a secret sect, which makes it very difficult for us to know I enough about him. They didn't, don't seem to have kept records. What was cultish about them? Um, and perhaps you can bring in the fact here that unusualness is that women came into this uh, sect. They, That's right. Hypatia yeah. of Alexandria, I, w I just wanted to say the name, actually. She was, she was part of it as well. Yeah, uh, she was a rather late part of it, but um, the, the, the cult was... Um, it was a, a secret cult in the sense that they, they were people who lived together as a group. Um, they lived with uh, quite an austere life, it's claimed, that uh, there are some of the, the, the latest stories out that these people didn't wash very often, and so this actually kept them separate from other people. Um, they had a, a lot of rather strange practices. Um, one of the most pop best known is about eating beans, I don't particularly want to go into, but they had all sorts of other prescriptions as well, that if you took your shoes off, you were supposed to take the right shoe off first, if you washed your feet, you were supposed to wash your left foot first. There must have been more to it than that though, I mean, what were, they, what were they believing in? I mean, you can't believe in taking your shoes off, well, maybe you can. Well, well these, these were, these were some, some of the things I think would help to bind the cult together. Yeah. The, the, the beliefs of the cult, though, were, were actually um, r rather um, more interesting. They believe, for example, in the transmutation of souls. This is something that they allegedly got from Pythagoras. They believed, in a way, they, um, in a way that influenced uh, a lot of later philosophers, that souls and bodies were actually separate. That um, the soul was something which um, actually could live on after the body was dead, and could actually move on into other bodies, even into other animals. And there are stories told about how. Pythagoras recognised one of his friends in uh, the barking of a dog. But this idea of the soul played through for the next hundred of years and then gathered great strength, uh, 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 in, particularly in Christianity, but in other things. This is an important thing. I mean, it's taken up in later Greek thinkers. It isn't, uh, it's, it's a mile away from putting your best foot forward of ever it was. That's right. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's something which greatly in influenced the, uh, the, the Platonists afterwards. And before we move on, can we just emphasise that it was open to women and that made yes. it rather extraordinary? Um, well, I don't know that we know very much about the other sort of sex that were available then, but certainly it was open to women, and the, uh, the, the fact that um, these people lived together in a, um, if you like, quite an austere way um, as a, a mixed group was actually something I think that is quite interesting as early as that. And certainly later on, um, other groups of um, intellectuals that lived together, lived together in monasteries or convents, and they were usually segregated, so they, Pythagoras, the Pythagoreans were actually quite in advance of that time from that point of view. And can you just briefly tell us a, a couple of his pupils whom we do know uh, enough about to say they unequivocally exist? Uh, I don't know about unequivocally, but... Well, uh, nobody uh, unequivocally exists. Uh, uh, well, none of us do, really. There was somebody called Hippasus, who was one of the... Um, the people early in the cult, and there, there are all sorts of stories about him, that uh, he was the person who possibly discovered that the, um, that the square root of two was a, a number which couldn't be written as a, um, a quotient of integers. Um, he may also have uh, um, discovered how to construct a, a dodecahedron, um, and there are stories that because of revealing this to other people, um, the gods in their, in their wisdom actually drowned him. So th there are stories like that. Um, those seem rather less well documented than some of the stories about Phil Allouts. Phil Allouts is somebody that did go on to actually do some further mathematics um, and is somebody who at least some of 
what he, what he did was actually written down. And so Aristotle actually refers to some of the things that he did. And, and Archetus is, re sorry, excuse me. Right? is referred to by Plato, isn't he? Or, or yes, that's right. And ta taught Plato? Or? Uh, uh, Archetus is, um, well, it was, he was a friend of Plato. Um, that he, um, The thing that's best known about him in all of his early biographies is that uh, when Plato was foolish enough to uh, go and visit a place called Syracuse, which is just around the corner from um, where these people were hanging out in southern Italy, it's in Sicily, um, he was um, detained by the person who was called the tyrant of, uh, of Syracuse. Tyrants were, um, well, the, the, the word is now regarded more pejoratively than it was then. But he was, re he was detained by Dionysius, and uh, Archytas was sufficiently powerful in, in the, some state in southern Italy that he was actually able to send a ship to rescue uh, Plato. And, uh, and that's the thing that people knew, knew most about Archytas in antiquity. But so we have lines developing, uh, even though they might be fragile and, and, and open to uh, dispute and non-existent, perhaps. Who knows? It's a, a, it's a mysterious part, part of intellectual history. Can you, Ian Stewart, have said that you think that the, the insight into the truth of reality being interpreted best through number was very powerful, long-lasting, and an astonishing insight? Now, can you talk to that? This idea, I think, has formed a lot of modern science. If you trace the history of modern science and you look at the pivotal points, you repeatedly find great scientists like, let's say, Kepler, who are looking for mathematical patterns in nature. They start out with the idea that um, they may not even be quite sure what the question is, but the answer is a mathematical answer. So Kepler looked for the mathematical structure of the movements of the planets. And he published a whole pile of stuff, some of it very speculative. He related the orbits of the known planets to the five regular solids in a way that is now considered to be total and complete nonsense. But he also came up with three laws of planetary motion, which were used later by Isaac Newton as the basis for his law of gravity. So this kind of Pythagorean view that numbers are the key to the mysteries of nature um, has paid off. And even nowadays we tend to measure how advanced a science is, how solid a science is, by how mathematical it is. How important were ratios and fractions? This is going to stir the... <laughs> stir the little grey cells. Uh, ratios and fractions. Well, let's go back to this, this chap, Hipp Hippasus of mm. Metapontum, and the whole business of uh, the square root of two not being an exact fraction. Um, the, the idea of number prior to that discovery was essentially whole numbers, things you can count, one, two, three, four. Um, but if you've got things like one, two, three, four, you rapidly come to the feeling that a half or three quarters or fractions of this kind are also perfectly reasonable numerical quantities. They're what happens when you split one number into a, a lot of equal pieces. But it's all built from whole numbers. So the Pythagoreans have this idea of everything in the universe being built from number, and to them this means whole numbers and, by extension, fractions, on the one hand. On the other hand, they have Pythagoras's theorem about right triangles, which tells you, uh, in modern language, that if you have a, a square with side 1, then its diagonal has length root 2, the square root of 2. And... Those two fundamental things that the Pythagoreans believed and were convinced in contradict each other because the square root of 2 is not a fraction. So this means that geometrically you can start from perfectly reasonable things like whole numbers, a square of side 1, and out of this emerges a natural object which must exist, it's diagonal, and you know that that's not one of the numbers that, uh, that you're happy with. But it worked, and it was so. And we will come to this later in the program. But Seraphina, let's take a numbers. I'm trying to keep the two things going: the mathematical and the, the mystical, as it were, because numbers um, had all sorts of meanings for them. The number five, the number uh, twenty-eight, the number women were even numbers, men were odd. Can you just talk to that? 
Yes, I think the first thing to keep in mind is that we talk about the mathematical and the mystical as if they were two separate categories. Because in our society, science and religion, spiritual and scientific, are two very different categories. But we know through the history of science that up until at least Newton, the two categories were not seen as entirely separate. They meshed into each other. So for them it made perfect sense that you can understand reality through number, but number means both things to do with the square root of two and things to do with what two means. So two may mean union. Five means marriage because it's the union of the first odd number and the first even number. One, do, one doesn't count as a number, does it, really? One doesn't really count as a number. So one we've got two and three are the first numbers, yes. Yes. Uh, one is not odd and is not even uh, in ancient mathematics in general and for the Pythagoreans in particular. The status and nature of one is one of the most debated topics in ancient mathematics. Uh, so let's just forget about one. Well, do we do a program on it? And we <laughs> Seven was seen both as the number of opportunity because uh, children can uh, come out of their mother's womb fully developed at seven months because uh, adults are developed at seven by two, which is 14. But seven is also the number of Athena the virgin goddess because the seven doesn't generate anything and is not generated by anything. So I think the two things were really in parallel. What we consider scientific and what we consider numerology for them were one and the same thing. So that's why five was marriage because two plus three equals five, the man and the woman e uh, equals marriage. Mm -hmm. And they found uh, perfect numbers like 28 which the, the divisors would add up to 28 yes. and so on. Yes. Any more? Uh, I think five could also be justice it? because it's a, a kind of, the union also means that you found a kind of uh, uh, harmony and uh, balance between two opposite principles and justice could be seen as fairness and balance. John O'Connor, one famous aspect of the everyday world that could be explained to some extent, maybe to a huge extent, by number, was music, which is attributed to Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans. Can you say a bit about that? Yes. The, uh, I mean, one of the things that I, I still tell our um, first-year undergraduates when they first meet the thing called the harmonic series, which is a series that goes one plus a half plus a third plus a quarter and so on, is that uh, the reason it's called harmonic is uh, because of Pythagoras that the story goes that Pythagoras was passing a, um, a forge one time and he heard the uh, um, the smiths banging away all their um, hammers on the anvils um, and so being a curious fellow he went in and uh, realised that sometimes the, the notes when they banged two things together sounded harmonious and sometimes they didn't and so he went in there and they, they measured the, um, the things that they were striking and they discovered that the harmonious notes came from um, when you had two things which were uh, a size which was represented by a small number. So, for example, if you had one thing which was twice the size of another, then it sounded harmonious, whereas if you had one thing that was, say, seven-eighths the size of another, it didn't sound harmonious when they were struck together. Um, it's, that's how the story goes, and that's, where the, that's the reason that mathematicians still call the harmonic series harmonic. Um, it's more likely, I think, that um, the Pythagoreans came across this knowledge by watching people tuning musical instruments, because that is one of the places where you do have to worry about that. And in particular, um, Philolaus and Archytas actually developed a, um, a very good theory, very similar to the theory that we have now, of, uh, of how notes match up, so that, for example, if you... Um, if you halve the, the length of a string, then the, the note goes up by one octave. So the ratio of two to one, one to two, is the, an octave. If you take a, a note which is, um, you um, reduce the string by two thirds, then the note goes up by what we now call a fifth. Reduce it by three quarters, then it goes up by what we now call a fourth. Um, and Archytas had worked out that if you took a, the two ratios corresponding, that's three over two and um, 3 over 4, and you multiply them together, then what you ended up with is you ended up with 2. So that if you take a, a fifth and a fourth and put them together, then you get a whole octave. Um, and if you do something um, even cleverer, and you go up by a fifth and down by a fourth, then you get a ratio of 9 over 8. 
And this is what uh, Archytas called the tone. And that's what we would now call two semitones, because it's actually two notes on the piano. Um, and one of the reasons that Archytas did much of the mathematics that he did was to try and work out if you could actually make a genuine semitone. That's to say, if you could actually split the, the tone, and the 9 eighths ratio, into two other ratios, which would actually form something in between those two. And he was able to prove that you couldn't. And that's actually one of the, the, the sort of the first applications of some really quite advanced number theory to uh, this particular idea. What it means is that um, the, by great good fortune, um, if you take this ratio of 9 over 8 um, and you take its sixth power, you get almost 2. You get 2.02, .02, which means that you can fit almost exactly six tones into an octave. And that's the basis for the sort of the, the modern piano, the fact that you can actually very nearly um, actually squeeze these things. You can temper the, the ratios a little bit, as we now call it, and fit these six tones into a whole octave. And so if they'd had the, um, the, the capability, they could have built a piano back in those days, but of course they didn't have the technology to actually do that. Ian Stewart, let's turn to this right angle triangle, which delighted us all so much. And the hypotenuse is one of the, one of the nicest words that we learned, isn't it? Right. Why is it so important? It's important for the whole of mathematics, in fact, because what it does is it relates three lengths. It relates the two shorter sides of a right angle triangle and the longest side, the hypotenuse. Probably the only time in your life you ever get to use the word hypotenuse is at school when you're talking about these things. Um, so, for example, in later mathematical developments when Descartes introduced so-called coordinate geometry, where everything's in terms of every point in the plane is given by two numbers, how far uh, east or west it is, how far north or south it is, and suppose you say, well, let's go three units east and then four units north, how far am I from where I started? Those are two sides of a right-angled triangle. And Pythagoras' theorem tells us that we can calculate how far away we have gone by squaring those two numbers, adding them up, and taking the square root, which in this case happens to give you 5. So if you know distances horizontally and distances vertically, you know all distances. So geometry can be reduced to number, and the concept of distance is built in thanks to Pythagoras' theorem. So this is one of the ways that it influences the subsequent development of mathematics because it helped to fuse the world of numbers and the world of geometry together into two different aspects of essentially the same thing. Santa Fina Cuomo, is there a sense in which, uh, again, ascribing without being... Is there a sense that this, this idea of the right-angled uh, uh, triangle was, was around uh, at the same time or even before Pythagoras is said to have been around? We find it in Egyptian... Uh, mathematical culture and Babylonian and so on? Yeah, we find it in other cultures. Um, we find, for instance, in uh, Mesopotamian mathematics, knowledge of so-called Pythagorean triplets, a series of numbers that correspond to the sides of a, a right-angle triangle. Three, four, five would be the first Pythagorean triplet. What we don't seem to find is a, a demonstration, a proof of the theorem in a, an axiomatic or deductive structure such as we find in Euclid's Elements, which is the first extant proof of Pythagoras', Pythagoras theorem. So the knowledge was there, but the proof came only later. So it's a question, it's an interesting example of technology getting on with using this mm. to build things and do things, not feeling necessary to prove it until, uh, or not, maybe not being able to, which was it was not necessarily not able, Serafina, which was it? To what essay, or was it? Were they not able to prove this theorem, or did they just not think it was necessary? Oh, that's, a, that's a very controversial question. <laughs> Myself, I think that actually they weren't interested uh, in proving it because if I had to say they weren't able, I'd have to make assumptions about mathematical ability of different civilizations that I don't think we can make really. I think mathematics, like everything else, is driven by some kind of need as well as by some kind of curiosity. And I think just different groups of people at different times have been driven by different curiosities and different needs. That's a wonderful science term. <laughs> <laughs> but Ian put his finger up, so let's see what happens. Well, I, I just want to reinforce what Serafina said, but say... Um, 
I mean, the, the whole concept of waterproof is has changed over the years, and I think Euclid is the first place where we know that someone seriously sat down and wrote down um, some idea of, of what it really means to give a logical proof of something. Um, but this idea that somehow you must have evidence that what you're saying is true must go back further. Um, I mean, w we can reconstruct, for example, how the Babylonians solve quadratic equations, and it's pretty clear that they knew how to do it, and they knew it was right. And in the case of the Pythagoras' theorem, you can draw fairly simple geometrical diagrams and point to them and say, look, it's obvious. So if this was on television, we could show a picture which would convince everybody in the audience immediately that Pythagoras' theorem must be true. So I think they may have known this kind of slightly experimental but very convincing argument. Um, Ian mentioned earlier about hitting a problem uh, with the uh, belief that whole numbers are things that matter, John O'Connor. Can you talk to that, the problem they hit? Yes, the... Uh, um the idea of number is actually really sort of a quite a complicated thing. That, um, that the idea that if you've got um, five apples or five inches, then the, these are examples of the of the number five. It's actually quite a sophisticated idea. Um, the way I think the Pythagoreans got round that was um, the the Why use of the monad. Why is it a sophisticated idea? Because most people listening say it's that obvious. I've got five fingers. I'm holding. Well, I haven't four <laughs> fingers and a thumb, and uh, and that isn't a sophisticated. That, well, that, that means if you're comparing this to apples, then you have to actually make a correspondence between one apple, two apples, three apples, and so on with your fingers. Um, the, the the idea of the number really comes from taking, if you like, the ratio of five apples to one apple. That gives you the number five. If you take mm -hmm. five inches to one inch, then you get the ratio of five. So, so really, an abstract number is, is really always a ratio. And it's a ratio by this, this magic number one, the monad, the, uh, the thing that generates the, um, all of the numbers. And that's one of the reasons why one was thought to be different from all of the other numbers. It's the thing that you always divided by, whereas the other numbers were the things which you actually, uh, you actually achieved as ratios. Um, and so the, um, the idea of, of number as coming in this sort of way, and the number in particular as, uh, as coming as ratios, is something that I think goes all the way back to um, the Pythagoreans, the idea that um, you've got fractions, that those are the ways that you actually build up numbers. Um, and that's the way that numbers really came in as abstract quantities rather than as um, particular examples of five apples, five fingers, um, five inches. Serafina Kwama, let's talk, begin to talk about the influence now <coughs> from the 4th century BC. How much influence did the Pythagoreans have, say, on Plato and his followers, and what sort of influence? The influence on Plato and his followers is enormous. In fact, um, in late antiquity, some uh, uh, neo-Pythagoreans would go as far as saying that Plato was just a Pythagorean. Um, I would pick out two main areas of influence on Plato and Platonism. One is to do with beliefs in the soul. So the, the distinction between body and soul and the fact that the body perishes while the soul continues in one form or, or the other is something that Plato was very keen on. It's discussed in the dialogue where he talks about Socrates' death and two of the characters in the dialogue are actually Pythagoreans and they talk about how Socrates' death is not the end of everything because his soul is going to live on. And the second main area where Plato could be said to be influenced by uh, Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans is, of course, um, the fact that number can provide a key to explain reality. In his cosmogonical treatise called the Timaeus, um, Plato, through his characters, tells how the universe began. And uh, you soon find out that the universe is organized along mathematical principles. All five elements have a geometrical structure. The harmony of the universe, the uh, correspondences between souls and bodies are governed by mathematical proportions. So in these two areas, Pythagoras influenced Platonism and then because of the major influence of Platonism on later thinkers, that's how Pythagoras' thoughts lived on. Uh, John McConnell, the Pythagorean thinker uh, Archytas, we've mentioned him before, had a relationship yeah. with Plato, seems to have saved his life, which is quite a strong relationship. Did he lay the ground for the idea of reasoning from, from basic truths, which uh, broadly uh, Plato developed? 
I, d I don't think so. The um, that Archytas was uh, was certainly not. Um, I mean, he was too early to be able to uh, prove things, if you like, from axioms. He didn't have an axiom system to to set up in in, in order to prove things. Um, he did, however, actually do some um, what we would now think of as as constructions. That he actually did some rather clever things. He actually managed to produce something which um, had been looked for for a long time the, the, the cube root of two the, uh, the Delian problem of doubling the size of an altar he was actually able to make a three dimensional construction to actually demonstrate that you could actually construct this particular number now you couldn't construct it using the, the ruler and compass methods that the um, that people spent a long time looking for um, constructions with but he was able to do this with a, a quite a complicated three dimensional construction um, people accuse this of being mechanical, but um, it, I mean it wasn't mechanical. It was really just the same as any of the other um, constructions that were people were using in, in two dimensions. That the the, uh, the Platonic idea that um, what you have is that you have a sort of virtual world of which the um, the, the real world is a, a concrete representation. So that when I draw a triangle on the blackboard and reason from that, I'm really reasoning about a, um, a virtual triangle which has the, uh, the sort of properties that, um, that, that I can actually then deduce from my imperfect diagram. And so Archytas was able to construct the, the cube root of two using something which, again, is a, a sort of a, a mind experiment, but it was in three dimensions rather than in two. Ian Stewart, you've referred to Euclid once or twice in, in, in this conversation, uh, as have others. Um, the elements of Euclid are one of the great books of, in, in the world in sort of laying down the laws of, math, ma laws of geometry and mathematics. Can you try to tell the listeners what influence you see? And it's a murky area, and, uh, but what do you, influence you see the Pythagoreans having on that, on Euclid, on that work? It's clear if you read Euclid that there must have been an awful lot going on that led up to what Euclid wrote down. It's very unlikely that some towering genius will simply sit down one day and start writing this stuff. There has to be a long tradition that he is collecting, formalising. And that tradition, among other things, must have its roots in the Pythagoreans and their way of thinking about things. Um, so what Euclid does is really say, let's systematise this, let's build it on first principles, let's strip it right back to the simple ingredients, straight lines, points, circles, and things like that. Let's go for what I think it, Plato had, the, the sort of ideal world of Plato. Um, let's write down what properties <coughs> this, this little mathematical piece of that ideal world will have, and then develop the whole of geometry in particular, but also number theory. A number of other things are actually in Euclid, which are often not taught today. The whole of the theory of irrational numbers is in Euclid. That goes back to Eudoxus. We have some idea where that comes from. And the culmination of Euclid is the classification and construction of the five regular solids, often called the Platonic solids, and known to the Pythagoreans. Certainly the dodecahedron was known to the Pythagoreans. So it's almost as if the objective of Euclid is to put some of this Pythagorean stuff on a sound footing. But I suspect there must be lots of other influences that came in as well. Serafina Cuomo, the Pythagoreans, they had an unusual view of the cosmos. Can you talk about that? Um, the view of the cosmos that uh, is unusual uh, is uh, reported in Aristotle and uh, is now attributed to Philoleus. Um, they a Pythagorean, yes. A Pythagorean, yeah. yes. Uh, writing in the second half of the 5th century BC. It was unusual because instead of putting the earth at the centre, he posited what they called a central fire. Uh, to give a name to this central fire, they called it by the name of the goddess of the earth, Hestia. So Aristotle reports this uh, model that is very unusual and for him completely wrong, where you have a central fire and all the other heavenly bodies rotating around it. Now, um, Aristotle criticized it. Not many people in antiquity seem to have picked up on it, but it seems to have inspired Copernicus. The um, book that created eventually the uh, heliocentric revolution 
um, is full of references to the Pythagoreans and in particular to Philoleus. In the dedicatory letter to the Pope, Copernicus even mentions by name Philolaus and uh, some other Pythagoreans as inspirations. So th they were the model. Uh, it did, the, the, the text had gone through, probably translated into Arabic, then back into Latin, so, and the text had gone through, and they, they picked up this idea of the central fire, that planets were moving around the central fire, which was then easy to relate, I suppose, to the sun. Yes, uh, Copernicus didn't know the text itself, but uh, there are reports of it in Cicero and Plutarch, which he would have known. In, in Stuart, and this drives through, this connection goes through, this goes through, it goes, there's a very strong, very clear link which goes essentially Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, Newton. And um, Isaac Newton is still in this mystical tradition. He's yes. often thought of as the first right. of the moderns, but uh, there's a lovely quote from John Maynard Keynes which says, no, he was the last of the magicians. He spent as much time in alchemy as he did on uh, mathematics and, and physics. And he thought his greatest work was on the book of Revelation. But, yeah, so the, all this stuff with calculus and the motion of the planets and everything else is just a sort of warm-up for the serious work it's on It's interesting, Revelation. back to what Serafino was saying earlier in the programme, that, that, that these two things were, were inextricably combined, that there wouldn't be the distinctions that we take up so readily. I think even today, uh, a lot of scientists, at the back of their minds is a little bit of this Pythagorean view that it's got to be mathematical, hasn't it? Why are the physicists looking for a theory of everything? They, they want an equation you can put on your T-shirt. They want the mathematical explanation of the world. It's a very Pythagorean thing to want. Finally, and I'm afraid briefly, John O'Connor, do you think it is still around, the, Pythag the yes, Pythagorean think, notion? Uh, if you're a uh, um, physicist working on um, your latest version of string theory, then you're still actually going back to your Pythagorean roots. You're still believing that there is a, a, a mathematical explanation out there which will actually explain anything that nature can throw at you. Right. Well, I think I should be brief. You're exemplary brief, and I'm now <laughs> paddling away <laughs> in a few more seconds. Well, I thought that was terrific. I hope I can remember what I've learned. Anyway, thank you very much to Serafina Cuomo, uh, John O'Connor, and to Ian Stewart. We won't be here next week. John Simpson will be here. We'll be back in a fortnight with the Samurai. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this BBC podcast, why not try others, such as Material World, where Quentin Cooper discusses everything from archaeology to zoology. To find out more, visit bbc.co.uk forward slash podcasts.